So, Jay Swanson, you are most welcome to the Low Season Traveler Insider Guides podcast. Great to have you on the show. I'm super excited to be here. It's, uh, it's great to have you. So we're going to be talking about Paris, which I admitted to you off air earlier that I've never actually been to Paris, which is actually very embarrassing. Um, no, nope, so, embarrassing about it. And nobody's been to Paris until they've been to Paris. I mean, that's well, a normal thing. That is true. But I live in the UK and there's, there's no excuse really for that. So I'm a little bit of ashamed. However, we're doing this podcast and I'm speaking to the right person to discover Paris. So I'm kind of excited about that. Absolutely. Oh, I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping to put you in the in the right the right track to see all of the right Paris, the versions of it that I get the feeling that you're probably more interested in than than the average tourist coming for their first time. Well, that's it. Yeah. I mean, look, first of all, tell us a little bit about how you came to be, you know, in my mind anyway, Mr. Paris. You know everything about Paris, you know, all the best places to go to, you know, how to experience it like a local. How did you come to to fall in love with Paris and, and have such an incredible knowledge on, on Paris? I think first I have to say that's an honor. So thank you very much for such kind words. I honestly, the, the funny thing is, is that I wanted to go to quote unquote France ever since I was a kid. So I, I studied French. I was all about it. I had this romantic idea of France sort of, but it was this weird amalgamation of, you know, ignorant inland American upbringing, I suppose. And when I first finally got to France, it was after college and I went to Nice and I immediately wondered if I'd made a mistake. I was like, this is very good for my French language. I don't know if I want to live here. And I got there right as things started getting rainy and there was all kinds of mafia stuff going on. I have all kinds of stories from Nice. And it wasn't until my trip back out where I spent a week in Paris leaving the country that immediately, as soon as I set foot in Paris, I was like, oh, this is what I always wanted. This is what I've always dreamed of. This is where I'm supposed to be. And I spent that entire week absolutely infatuated with the city. I had a friend who was showing me around who up before then I'd never felt romantically towards. And suddenly I was romantically interested in literally everything. And I just, I absolutely fell in love with it. And so it became a goal of mine to make it back, which is tricky for Americans, unfortunately, but I finally made it work. Very good. And so how long have you been in Paris now? Well, the first time I got here was in 2012. I lived here for a year and then I you know, kind of came back through when I could, but I moved, I immigrated officially in 2017. So I've been here for, that make it six years, six, almost yeah. seven years. Wow. I mean, are, 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 are you, are you French? Yes. Have you got, I mean, officially. I am. I would be if, if the, if the, well, okay. I got to be careful because you never know when they're listening. Right. <laughs> but uh, if the French administration would get their rears in gear, I would be because I, I applied in February. I was eligible as of last year. And so I got everything put together, applied, and now I'm just waiting to get my interview, which I would have hoped to have had in the last few months. I finally emailed them to be like, hey, you guys forget about me. And they haven't forgotten about me, which is okay. either a good thing or a very bad thing. We'll find out. And, and will, will you have to do some kind of a nationality test or something? You have to, you know, try yes. a whole lot of cheeses and identify them. And How many like cheeses them. can you balance on the soles of your feet while doing a handstand and singing the Marseillaise is, I believe, the baseline. Seven so far. I've gotten up to seven cheeses. Yeah, they actually do. You have to you have to be able to speak French at at least at B1 level, which is thankfully for me, not a problem. And then you will get a quiz and that quiz is always different. I think the first thing that they always ask is, why do you want to be French? Which funnily enough, I know a through hearsay, it is a friend of a friend kind of a story. So take this with a grain of salt. But uh, I, enough people know this person that I believe it's true. Did say when they asked, why do you want to be French? That they had no idea why. And the interview immediately ended. So you do have to have a good reason, I suppose, or any reason. And then after that, it could be 15 minutes of pleasantries, or it could be 30 minutes of grilling you on overseas territories and the rivers of France. You never know. Wow. Okay. Sounds like you've got some homework to do. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I feel like I'm pretty prepared, but th there's a really good chance that, that I need to prepare more. Yeah. Yeah. Fair play to you. So, so tell us a little bit, you know, again, for the uninitiated and for any other listeners out there that, that maybe haven't, like me, made it yet to Paris. What's the appeal of Paris? Why is Paris so amazing? And why should we consider it? It's a very good question. I think especially the longer you live here, the more you actually ask that question of yourself. No, the Paris immediately is obviously it's very beautiful. I think especially if you are not immediately overwhelmed by a large city, because I think with the first time I the very first time I got here, I was on my way into Nice and I was incredibly overwhelmed. 
because I'd never been in a city like it before. But there's something about the culture, the lifestyle, the way that people do move a little bit more slowly. You have your cafe culture. You have at least an hour for lunch. People have a glass of wine with lunch. You just get this vibe that people are here to live first and then maybe work later. And so there's an element of repose. And uh, even though it can be bustly and overwhelming, if you're a small town kid like me, at the same time, you get a feeling that the lifestyle has to be one of the best lifestyles you've ever seen before. And I think that it's something that really draws people in. There's obviously a lot of lore around French culture and Paris in particular, especially for Americans. Those of us who are good hope to die and come here, as it is said. But those of us who are lucky enough to to actually make the jump to live here, I think we're drawn by a number of things from the availability of culture all the way to the fact that, yeah, you can have some wine at lunch and literally no one will judge you. Yeah, it's quite unusual, like, because I know certainly here in the UK, drinking at lunchtime, and it was the same in Ireland as well, was just very much a no-no. I mean, it was, that was seen as highly unprofessional. And from what yeah. I've heard in, you know, in, in France and in Paris, you know, th that's where business is done. I mean, that's what you have to do in order to, to, to get the business. You've got to bring somebody out for a three hour lunch and, you know, really um, yeah. kind of enjoy it. And I just think what a civilized way to do business. That's phenomenal. Yeah. Everyone should do business that way. It's great. It just means that very little happens. So I think that's always the trade-off is like, yeah, it's very pleasant. And then you it will get this deal done in about three months. So that is the, that's always the trade-off. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's, I, I think that's, it sounds to me like a lot of, a lot of the way the, the Parisians are and the French are in general, it does seem to be, you know, about living life first and, you know, everything else comes a little bit secondary. You know, the famously the French have, you know, a lot more holidays than, than most in Europe. And I think that's to be celebrated. I mean, that's the way it should be. You know, you, yeah. life should be about living and, um, and you know, not necessarily putting work first. And it's almost, I mean, do you find it's the opposite culturally of somewhere like the US? <laughs> yeah, I think on a lot of those, in a lot of those ways, I can imagine greater opposites, but at the same time, yeah, I mean, it's funny. There are a lot of memes about that, about, you know, American workers talking to their European colleagues and it's pretty incredible because even for me, since I'm independent, I don't track well with the holidays. Like I actually made this joke recently where I, because I already lose track of time as it is on a lot of, on any given week, there are a lot of times where I step outside and I just look around and I'm like, did, did Sunday come early this week? Like what, where is everybody? What, what is today? And yeah, there, there are a lot of holidays there. And then you also not only have holidays, but you have what's called the pont or the bridge. So if a holiday falls on a Thursday, a lot of people will then take the bridge to the weekend and just like, oh, I just won't work on Friday either. And so they'll take one of their vacation days because they get, you know, five, six weeks of vacation, which is already hard enough to use sometimes. So then a lot of times people end up taking four or five day vacations over a weekend because they just happen to be a holiday somewhere in the middle there. And they're like, yeah, well, why don't we just turn this into, you know, an extra week off? Why not? Indeed. God, I'd love to do that. It seems yeah. like a, it seems like a very civilized way to uh, to run a country to me. Yeah, they definitely have some. There's some definite perks to living here. I think that I think the the main sacrifice you have to make is an anglophone because I think this is true across most anglophone cultures is convenience. I think we have a pretty pretty strong emotional tie to convenience, and when you first move here, it can be really frustrating to discover that. The things that you're used to buying all in one place are separated between multiple places and half of them are just closed on Mondays. And then the other ones have all closed for lunch. And then, you know, it's just like all those kinds of things where you just run into a lot of barriers initially because you don't understand the flow of life here. But once you get into that flow, I remember even though Nice was the struggle for me in some ways, I really remember how wonderful it felt because if you made it to the bank and, you know, got one little piece of business done and then you also did your laundry, that was a big day. Like you, you got a lot done. And so that, that there's an element to that where I think there is something that can be healthier to that lifestyle for sure. And I, I, it's, it would be hard for me to go back to the States. I think that I would, I would struggle in, in a number of ways, but like it, it, I do get a little, I, the last time I was back in the States, actually, I ended up sitting in an airport <laughs> restaurant and I, I just wanted to eat something in between flights. I was taking a domestic flight to get to see my family. And I just remember sitting at the bar. And the chit chat that between the Americans, where I used to say how much I missed American chit chat and how you can make jokes and just kind of strike up conversations wherever you went, it blew my mind. Like the things these people were sharing about their lives 
you know, and I was, and I was just trying to, try, I was like, do they already know each other? Is he flirting with her? Like, what is happening here? And halfway through all these questions, because I was just avoiding eye contact and trying to eat my meal. I've been awake for like 30 hours at this point. And I was just like, oh my God, I've gone European. Like I'm full French at this point when it comes yeah. to at least this element. And so there, there are definitely some big changes that come and you start to see, you start to see both sides of the coin a little more quickly, maybe. Yeah, yeah, fair play. You said before that you're, you know, obviously you're a pretty good level French speaker. How important is it to be able to speak a bit of French to get the most out of a trip to Paris? Well, the, the number one thing that I always tell people when they're coming here is to say, is just to learn how to say bonjour, which I think is, mm. is a pretty low bar. Yeah. But the, in Paris, especially uh, the English has gotten significantly better. There's a lot more especially the younger generation really want to learn it. They've been watching Netflix. They, you know, are consuming a lot more English media and there's, there's a hunger for it that wasn't here a decade ago when I first, or even longer ago when I first, first moved here. And so English is definitely a leg up for travelers. Mm -hmm. If you can say bonjour though, that is the magic word because in French culture, especially restaurants, but even businesses are an extension of the hum. And that you can see that in the way that people will name their restaurant, you know, Chez Jean. It literally means Jean's house, right? Or in Jean's home. And so when you walk in, that is the, basically the, the ritual or the polite way to announce yourself to say bonjour. And you will see immediately, um, if you haven't been saying it before, let's say you're day, in, on day three, and you're like, man, everybody seems kind of cold. On day four, if you start saying bonjour, I'm not going to say that it's going to win everybody over entirely, but you will have a completely different experience. So starting there is really big. And then any effort you can make after that will be appreciated. And generally, you'll be intercepted just by the way you said bonjour. People will probably switch to English, which can be frustrating to people who just want to practice their French. But, you know, the nice thing is that you're going to get around. You're going to be fine. There's no reason to feel anxious about not speaking French in Paris because so many people speak English. And despite the reputation, Parisians are very helpful. If you are lost and you need help, you may be a little intimidated to stop somebody. But by and large, Parisians are very, very helpful. Well, that's good to know. That's good to know. Yeah. Let's, it's not like in Ireland. In Ireland, when I was in Dublin, the first time I went to Dublin, literally every five steps when I was like, wait, somebody was there to be like, do you need help? And so it's, it's not, if you're coming from that context, it's not, it's not, but yeah. they are, they're surprisingly helpful. Very good. Very good. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about, you know, what there is for, for tourists who would be looking to go over maybe for a, a long weekend from, from the UK or Ireland. And of course, especially in, in the low season. First of all, low season, when it, is there a quiet time in Paris from a, from a tourism point of view, or is it just rammed all year round? I was going to make a joke that COVID was really quiet. Like yeah. but things have come back in full force. I mean, it is Paris, you know, I think 2022 was the most visited city in the world. So for, we talked about this offline too, for low season travel, it is definitely like a city that has very high seasons. The summer is definitely when you, if you're looking to do low season, do not come in the summer. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, generally speaking, over winter is going to be is going to be lower and even heading into spring. So for, for me, the two most pleasant times to be in Paris for the weather, especially have traditionally been May and September because it's warming up in May and then it's cooling off in September. In the middle of summer, it gets very, very hot. And then over the winter, it turns into, you know, just rainy and gray, which can still be very beautiful and wonderful. But those two seasons are very nice. However, September tends to be busier. May tends to be less busy. That is changing. Oh, okay. And now April is getting warmer as well as the cherry blossoms show up like a week or two earlier all the time, it feels like every year. So I would say that that's kind of going to be, maybe April would be a great idea. But if you really want to come when there's nobody around, then I would aim for something like February. A lot of people do show up. A lot of tourists come here for Christmas. A lot of Americans come here for Thanksgiving for some reason. Strange, it's hard to get turkeys here, but people still do it. So in that way, I would say probably winter is going to be your best bet. Yeah. And it is, is there still as much appeal in, in the winter? And, you know, what kind of, what kind of things would you recommend? If, if we were taking a, a, a low season trip in, say, February, I was going to go yeah. along with my wife um, and give her a, a treat because she wants to go to Paris as well. What oh, are perfect. the things, what are the kind of experiences that, that we could hope to have? I would definitely go into the second around his month if I were you guys, and I would hit up the covered passages. So the second is famous for these covered passages that came around back when 
the streets were just slop, right? It was animal feces everywhere and mud and probably human feces. Let's be honest, it's Paris. Mm. And so you needed a place to go to get out of the rain and to shop without walking through literal muck. And they built a lot of these covered passageways that are really, really lovely. My favorite is probably Passage au Panorama. So the Panorama Passage uh, has a lot of restaurants in it, some really fun shops. But I wouldn't limit myself to that. I think that it's pretty cool because you can actually spend a good day wandering through a lot of them. If you're curious to just kind of see what they're like, it's a good way to get out of the cold. And then in that neighborhood as well, I think the second is a hidden gem. It's overlooked. Yeah. There aren't any parks or monuments. It's very central. It's very close to everything, but it doesn't have any of those classic tourist draws, which is why it can be really nice to go walk around. It does have a little bit less on the coffee front, but that's fine because you're a short walk away from some really good coffee. But it it hits really hard for both restaurants and bars. And so if you can do that, there's also, believe it or not, I, you may have seen this on online because it, it did the rounds last year, but there's a library in the center of the second. Don't quote me on that geographically, but it is like the heart of the second, the Richelieu Library. They just finished it not that long ago and it is free to enter. There is a museum that you have to pay for to go upstairs, but the ground floor has an amazing reading room called the Oval Room and it is one of the most picturesque picturesque rooms uh, that I've seen in a very long time. Gorgeous. And just nice to get out of the, get out of the cold. You can sit and during the summer, you can get out of the heat too. They actually have air conditioning and just get into a nice quiet environment that definitely is not the kind of thing the average tourist will ever find. I love that. You're not going to get the cues that you would get at some of the other tourist traps, I guess. Not I'm, yet. The more I talk about it, maybe it'll change. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah, man. That's yeah. what people always say to me on low season travel. That are saying, "Don't, don't tell everybody about the low season." So, well, and then you're like, "Sorry, I've already hit record." Like, I don't yeah, know why you're too late for that. Too late. Yeah, exactly. The the kind of the, the big the big cliche, you know, kind of bucket list items that people tend to think of with Paris. You know, the likes of the Eiffel Tower, Arc de Triomphe, the Champs Elysees, these kind of places. Are they? Are they, are they cliched for a reason? I mean, is, uh, would they be recommended by you? To, are they worth I just want to seeing? start by complimenting your pronunciation of these names. I'm very impressed oh, for somebody who's never been to France. Yeah, very thank good. You very much. Thank you. Yeah, impressive. You got, it sounds like you can do a French R, which is one of the hardest things. Yeah, I would say the Champs-Élysées, I, I don't know if you mentioned it, but avoid it. That, would, that one is, really? the Champs-Élysées is an overhyped strip mall at this point. Like, unless you really want to go to McDonald's, or Five Guys. There is a Burger King around the corner as well. You know, they've got Almost. all the box, big box oh, retail. Shame. And the problem is that it's because that the the real estate is too expensive for anybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, even like I Disney pulled out for their own reasons, but there, you know, there's a Disney store, there's a Samsung store, there's all that kind of stuff. And to me, that's the kind of stuff you can you can literally go to any mid sized city almost in the world, I feel like, and you can find all these brands. Or just order them online. You don't really need to go shopping there. So the Champs Elysees is is my number one thing within Paris that I would say just go ahead and totally avoid it. Most of the major monuments in the city are worth seeing at least once. You know, the for me the Eiffel Tower because it took me years of seeing it for the magic to wear off. So there's something very special about the tower, and it will hold its appeal for a very long time. I would say going up it once is fine, and I would definitely. This is very hard to do because it is very popular. But if you can ever get up there when there is when there are fewer people so probably winter is a good time on a wintry stormy day when no one wants to be outside that is probably the day to go to the eiffel tower you might be a little cold and miserable but it is beautiful it's a wonderful structure and it does offer a nice view however i also would always say that the best views of paris have the eiffel tower in them so ideally you would want to be somewhere where you can see the eiffel tower and for me one of the things out of the things you just uh, listed the arc de triomphe offers a really fun and unique view because it is on a hill not a big hill, but it's on a subtle hill where it gives you straight sight lines all the way down to the Louvre. You have a wonderful view of the Eiffel Tower, not that far away. You can see Montmartre. You can look out towards La Défense in a way that you would never really see it before. So you get a really good sense of like the layout of the city on its axis along that street. And I really find it to be a very, and for me, that one's always worth it. Like I really, really, yeah. I really like that one. The other one I would, I personally would be happy to never go back to, and I even made a video about this, would be Versailles. Go ahead and skip Versailles. Like, really? honestly, oh my gosh, yeah. please. Like, for one, it's over. It's unbelievably inundated with human bodies. Like, if you if you want to rub shoulders for an hour and a half and have no exit except to finish the whole thing, go for it. Yeah, then you're going to really, really love it. Also, like, the history of Versailles, there are two things. 
I won't go on too long of a tirade about Versailles here, but there are two things about Versailles. I, I, I was a tour guide out there for a summer, a bike tour guide. The grounds of Versailles are lovely and the market is amazing. One of the, one of my favorite markets in all of France, which is on Mondays, Fridays and Sundays, I think. Wait, don't quote me on that. Mondays, Thursdays. Mon well, anyways, your, your listeners can look it up. I should have this memorized, but the, the market outside is phenomenal. The grounds are amazing. If you go on a tour, I have a few friends that do some really interesting tours out there. The main thing would be to go to the market, have a picnic, enjoy the grounds. But once you get into the palace and the gardens, they're so expansive. It already took you so long to get out there. It's, it's taking you so much time to walk, to stand in line. By the time you actually get in, you're already pretty tired. Then you're stuck. And then after you've seen about two or three rooms of the palace, you've basically seen the whole palace because there, it doesn't really change very much. And by the time we get to the Hall of Mirrors, you might be a little bit underwhelmed unless you are a huge fan of the history behind that room. And then about two thirds of the way through, if you're observant, you might notice that there's actually no historical description of why the palace is particularly important to France or how the opulence might have led to some significant symbolic issues with the country and maybe led to some heads literally rolling. And you get to the end and there's actually like a war room that just glorifies the the conquests of France. And you're like, well, we skipped. There's a part of the history here where we went from kings of France to Napoleon the emperor. There's a really interesting omission here. And so anyways, mm -hmm. by the time you get out of it, you realize, oh, this is a bunch of royalist propaganda. And I'm not really sure why I walked through this entire thing. If you want to see a real palatial building that won't take you nearly as long to see and will be deeply satisfying, Palais Garnier, the opera in the middle of Paris, very easy to get to. You can take tours. You can also get cheap nosebleed seats, which means you can see the opera and walk around the interior on your own, unsupervised. And it's that is an incredible building. I love that building. It's so satisfying to check out. Yeah. Currently draped in some art by JR, the French mm -hmm. artist. And uh, yeah. I, I, I promised I wouldn't go on too long of a tyrant of Versailles. I might've broken that promise, but there you go. I, I'd skip it. I love that. I love that. No, but that's good. That's, that's the kind of, that's the kind of information that we, that we want to know about with regards to the, the kind of the, the hidden gems that people might not be aware of in Paris. And if they go in for the first time, maybe they want to see stuff that other people haven't seen away from the, away from the crowds, but, but equally kind of special. What are the kind of hidden gems that you you, you would recommend? I mean, there's so many hidden gems for, I mean, everything from parks, it depends on the season too, I suppose, right? Like I've been mm. thinking about this a lot because I'm putting some itineraries together for people. I think that it, whether it's my, my favorite park in the city is actually Bouchamont, which is in the Northeastern portion of the city. It is not a place tourists go. It's very local. It's just a wonderful park that has a lot of topography to it. And it was landscaped under Napoleon III. This has a very special feel to it. It's a great place to go for a picnic or a stroll or a run if you need to run while you're on vacation. Mm. And just below that is Canal Saint Martin, which is the the canal of Paris. It's funny. There's so many there are people that live here that have lived here for years that don't realize there's a canal in Paris, and that blows my mind because the canal it used to be a you know a decade, fifteen years ago, people talk about how it was definitely kind of a sketchy area of town, and it's definitely changed into being one of the best spots for food, for drinks. The nightlife is really great. Wonderful vibes. And again, not touristy at all. It is way past where most tourists will ever even dream of going. I know a lot of Parisians that won't go up there, but it is phenomenal. So I'd say those are two landmarks that'll kind of guide you. Bouchamont doesn't have as much directly around it, but Canal Saint-Martin, especially in the 10th, so you're going to find a lot of really good stuff. Love it. Love it. What about, you know, we can't go to Paris or even talk about Paris without talking about food. Uh, and drink, I guess, as well. Yeah. Um, any recommendations that you could offer for where to where to eat something typically Parisian and drink something typically Parisian as Explain. well as well as well as you know as well as just ge generally what what kind of foods should we be trying when we go? Well, I mean, it depends on your listener. I think for me, I only eat maybe twenty percent French when I when I'm eating because. The, I think what goes under, and I can give you some examples, some really good recommendations for French food. So uh, don't worry about that. But what I was going to say is that what goes very unappreciated, I think, in France is how inter or in Paris in particular is how international it is. I think when you go to New York or London, you you don't you don't go to London and think what kind of British food can I eat while I'm there, unless you know you really want to try fish and chips. You're probably going for like a good curry. You know, like you're not you're thinking about yeah. international foods. I found a really great American pizza last time I was in London and 
when you're going there, you're kind of there to taste what the world has to offer and how they're presenting it to London. And that's how I see Paris. When I'm in Paris, there's there are amazing foods, whether it is there's a really great new Indian place here or there's some wonderful Vietnamese food. There's so many amazing creative takes on food here. I think that people will shortchange themselves and they think, oh, well, we'll go and we will just eat French food because there is some great French food here. But there, it, is, it does limit you to some, unfortunately, I think a really small part of what can be the full Paris experience. That said, if you want like a really good brasserie experience, that's kind of a little bit of a level up from your corner bistro, but it's going to be very, very photo worthy and also satisfying. I would go somewhere like Brasserie du Bio which is on Rue Saint-Denis, which is also a very interesting street to work because it's got a long and sordid history as being one of the hearts of prostitution in the city. So you'll still see some leftovers of that. Now, it's not like walking through Amsterdam, but you'll still see a few things. You're like, well, really? Is that really? So there's a little bit of that, but the food is very good. They have a couple other locations. That one's a really, really uh, great spot. And then Lou is one that I've really enjoyed recently. If you're into natural wine and kind of a more modern take, on some French cuisine. It won't necessarily be French classics, but it's a, a French team and some really, really good food at Lou Paris. That's just a really fun vibe as well. Very good. We're starting to run out of time. It goes by really quick, Jay, doesn't it? I always say this to yeah, every guest, it flies over. Give us some of your kind of quick tips, general tips for people never been to Paris before, just anything that they, that they kind of should know. Obviously they should, they should certainly guess Paris in my pocket. And of course, we Thanks. have a we have a discount code uh, for them, which you've very generously given for low season travelers, which is low season 15, and they get a 15% discount. Um, so certainly they should have a copy of Paris in my pocket naturally to get the most out of the city. Give us some of your quick tips to to get the most out of it and to, and to, consider, to consider when people are traveling. Quick tips. I think one would be to... I, 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 I would say one would definitely be to slow down and really just enjoy the city. I mm -hmm. think that there are a lot of people that feel like they have to see everything and that they have to do everything and everything has to be the best possible. And as somebody who is always looking for stuff that he loves so that I can share it, I also recognize that there's such a huge value in just sitting down on a corner bistro, getting an incredibly overpriced Heineken and sitting there for an hour with my friends. Because even though the beer is not great and the service isn't either... I'm there with my friends and there's Paris and you get to watch the world go by. The second is related to that, which would be to make sure to do the people watching. The number one, like, I guess you'd say sport, spectator sport in Paris is people watching. They, they literally orient the seats on terraces facing outward so you can watch the world pass you by. Everybody's out, whether or not they want to open up to this, everybody's out to be seen. Everybody's happy to be looked at at least a little bit. And you'll see some very interesting characters while you're here in Paris. So I'd definitely say that. And then the last quick tip that I'd give you would probably be to pick the one thing that you absolutely have to do that you think this is the thing that Paris is all about. And then to pick one thing, maybe one of the things that I just mentioned that seems off the beaten path, seems weird or bizarre, um, but is something that somebody you at least put a little trust in has told you, yeah, but this is what we really love about Paris. And just go see what it's all about. And I think that the beauty of Paris, the way that I've discovered it, the way that I found 90% of my recommendations has literally just been getting off the beaten path, seeing some spire in the distance, trying to find it, and along the way, finding about 10 other things. Paris will give you so many things if you just explore it and open yourself up to getting a little bit off the beaten path. I love that. I certainly intend getting off the beaten path a little bit myself, and I, of course, will be downloading the guide. Jay, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm so happy that we finally got to to record this podcast and to feature Paris in the low season, which sounds absolutely amazing. And, you know, it really struck a chord with me there. The people watching, I could sit down in a cafe and just people watch, you know, for, you know, easily a full day. And, and, and I'm sure I would really, really enjoy it. But hey, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And look forward to uh, catching up with you maybe next year. And we'll get some more tips from you if that's okay. I would love to. Thank you for having me. I'm really grateful to be uh, your first Parisian guest. And I certainly hope to be maybe your second or third as well. Um, but to everybody coming, I, I really hope you come and enjoy just this city. I love this city so much. That's the only reason that I share it the way that I do. Um, and my hope is that by, you know, giving a few tips and tricks here, I can help people to have a better time when they come to Paris. So I really appreciate the opportunity to share just a little bit of my love for this city with you today. Thanks a million, Jay.
Thank you.